<laughs> Very good. All right, let's do this. So if you guys ever want to see like the README, like if you're doing like a code challenge or you have anything like this, you can always see the README pre preview. Like it's like Control Shift M, and it'll actually show you what the markdown looks like um, as it's rendered on like GitHub or something. So that's kind of like how I'm doing this. Cool. So like Markdown is just like a programming language where if you write certain syntax, it will come up a certain way in the same way that HTML is a markup language. So like if you take a look at the actual README, I have all these like hashtags or octothorps. I don't know what would you guys want to call them. These like pound signs. And then if you look, it actually just makes this like a header. And if I want all these like bullet points, then I'm just going to drop a couple of these dashes here. If I drop a bunch of stars, it'll make that word bold. And so this is just basically what it looks like. Cool? How y'all doing today? All right, this is going to be very fun and exciting for me. I can feel the energy in the room. It's electrifying. You're going to be like Hulk Hogan, you guys. Like, come on. Jesus Christ. All right. Cool. So what is the DOM? Yeah, we can say that. But what is the DOM? Yeah, what does that really mean, though? Yeah, right. So the DOM document object model, you could think like basically we work with just objects in JavaScript, right? So when the browser gets HTML, it needs to convert that HTML into something that we would like to look at. So it's like a markup language. So for example, like if I were to go to a popular website like old Google, this right here is like the website, right? This is the DOM. It's being rendered. But what the HTML really looks like at the end of the day is it just looks like this. This is what got sent across. Oh my god. Uh, uh, come on. Where is this thing? I'm just going to close it up. Cool. This is actually what gets sent across as the HTML. All right, this is not a great user experience. Like if I were to open up the body and I were to take a look at everything in here, right? Like who would see this on the right and be like, wow, what a great website. I can tell that this is a fantastic popular search engine. Like nobody, right? And this would just be like a terrible user experience. The idea here is that it takes all of this and it takes every single one of those pieces and through like this mapping process, it will build this website. And so the DOM, you can think of like, the whole thing is one document, right? It's an object, and because it's an object, we can use JavaScript to interact with the key values, so to speak, inside of it, and there's a model that it uses. Every time it sees a span, every time it sees an H1, every time it sees a div, it knows what to do with that and how to paint it on the screen. And so the reason we say the DOM is a tree, well, it's like an upside down tree, actually, is there's very few computer science topics that we'll actually kind of cover, but one of them is going to be the fact that there's something called like a, a tree. And so this is kind of what it looks like. Each one of these things are nodes. So you can think of like this node 2, right, has two sort of branches off this node. And so you can think of them as children. So like what are the children of node 2? 7 and 5, right? And what about the children of node 7? This two and six. So because seven is sort of like this parent and two and six are children, what is the relationship between two and six? Yeah, they're siblings. And so like these phrases directly translate in terms of how we have to like traverse the DOM, and I'll explain that in a second. What about the relationship between six and nine? Cousins. Cousins. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as like cousin. Um, in like JavaScript, but yeah, they're not directly related in any way. If I needed to get from six to nine, I'd have to go parent element, parent element, go through the children, select this five node, and then that child. Cool? So it's like a tree because this is what your HTML looks like, right? You have body tag, then you have one div wrapper. Inside the div wrapper, you have a couple of children. And so what's the relationship between these two LIs? They're siblings, all right? So if you take a look at this, right, you could see this body, right, and then it has this div as a child. And how many children does this div have? One, one right? This div closes here, and it has one child, and that's this div. 
Cool. All right. So there's all this like stuff. Uh, how familiar are you guys with HTML? Like just like a like I'm pretty good with the basics of HTML. I know what a div is, an h1 tag is, a p tag, an li tag, or like I have absolutely no idea. Pretty good. Okay. So what are your questions for those that are like gladiator style or like thumbs down? What would you like to know? Oh, this is going to be a blast. <laughs> okay. So All right. In HTML, when do you have some links um, other than the other things? Okay. When? I guess when you have like multiple paragraphs in the list, those would be similar. Yeah. So you would have a lot of children as you start to get better and better at CSS. I know that Charlie gave you like this two parter fantastic CSS lecture, right? Plus, plus, Charlie. Charlie, plus, plus. Um, the, idea, the idea here is that like, as you start to style things, you start wrapping them in like, these div tags. And so these divs will typically have a lot of children. So like, sometimes you'll wind up seeing HTML that kind of looks like this. Just to get to this H1, I'm adding all of these extra classes that wrap around. So I will wind up having a ton of children just to get to this one H1. Oh. So, in your previous example where you said the um, have the children did uh, that one thing to have, why was it only one and not two if there was another div above the tag? Yeah, so the question is um, in this example, right, why does the div with the ID of outer node only have one child? Yeah. Right? So remember, this div has one child, right, which is this right here. And this particular div has one child, which is the H1. And so, if you look at it, this div only has one child, which is this one right here. If you look back here, it would be like if this p tag had one div, and then had one div, and then had like three divs underneath. So, like, what would an example be of like that uh, and if it had more than one child? If it had more than one child? Right, great. So, let's do that. Like this div right here, huh? It does, yep. And so like, let's say this div, right, has how many children? One. If I wanted to add another child, I would just put like a p tag right here. And just put another child. Cool? However, if I were to do something like this and then put a div inside here, this div would be a child of the p tag, not necessarily a direct child of this div. Huh? Yep. Uh, not always, but it's where it's nested. Yeah. And so this becomes really important. I'm not sure how much emphasis this has been for you in mods one and two, but mod three, you have to learn how to indent your code. If you don't indent your code properly, it becomes an absolute nightmare to kind of route through. So for example, you can see that this outer node very quickly has two children, right? This div with semantic and this span. And you can even use these lines to kind of follow through and see that under this one outer div, if you follow this line right here, you see the first div, and then you scroll down and you see this span here. And so if you want to turn those on, uh, you just go into your settings. You want me to show you, or you guys are okay? I don't know what that thumbs up means. Like, show show me, or like you guys are okay? Okay. So the idea here is like you could see it, but if you don't indent your code, right? How many children does that div have? It'd be an absolute nightmare. Like it, like you know it's two, but like if you were looking at this code for the first time, it'd be an absolute nightmare. And so, anyways, the idea here is you have to learn how to indent your code. If you don't as well, JavaScript doesn't have these like do ends, which are very easy to follow. It has these curly braces and it has a lot of parentheses. And as you start to write a lot of callbacks, they get really nested. And then you get stuck in what is known as like JavaScript hell. Because if you forget one parentheses, you have like, no idea where to put it. And it becomes a nightmare to debug, but it's going to be OK. All right, so. OK, that's a good question. Do you, is the same question? Okay. 
let's actually go dive into that, ready? So there's something called CSS um, specificity. And this is what determines what actually gets rendered on the screen. So there's one that I really like, not this one. It's like with fishes. Uh, yes, this one, oh, this one's money. Dang it, no, this is not it. All right, it's basically this one for all intents and purposes. Ah, there's a website for it. CSS specificity. This one's adorable. This one. All right, so check it out. The idea is that um, the IDs and classes will add to a certain value, and that's what actually will render. So there are times where you will have multiple. If I go into like my elements, sorry. Man, I'm like losing it over here. Let's look up, pull up the drawer. I don't, man, there's a way to get rid of this. All right, either way. So there's something called, where is it? Style. And so like you'll see that this has like some user agent style sheet. If you have your own style sheet in your CSS, so like index.html, you'll have your own style sheet. If you're pulling in Bootstrap, there'll be another style sheet. If you're pulling in all these different style sheets, right, it's CSS, it's cascading style sheets. So every one that you put on will be calculated. In order to figure out what actually gets rendered, you'll actually have to figure out what is known as like the computed styles. So like at the end of the day, this is what is showing. Right? There's like a margin here, there's a display of block. But if I had multiple style sheets, you have to compete to see which one will actually render. And so if I add a certain class to something, so there's like the star, asterisk, that means I'm grabbing everything. I can grab just the tag itself, like a div tag, a p tag. It'll apply that CSS to all the p tags and all the divs, whatever tag I put on there. And so notice you'll see like this counter, right? So this right here is the tag. This right here will be the class, and this right here will be the ID. So if I do nested, right, where it's like the li, and in that li, there's an unordered list that counts as two. So I can do body, div, inside the div, there's a bunch of tags, then there's a ul, there's an li, eventually a p, and then an anchor tag that's nested in there. That winds up being like 12 points in the tag class. If I have like a class, however, you can start to see the points that get added up. So if I do li.myclass, I have one class and one element. Eventually, I can do all this crazy stuff, and then that's what takes precedent. The higher the points, all right, the more it will be shown. So you have like inline styling, which is like, as you can tell, it's its own category. And then you can override everything with this powerful bang important. And that is like the nuke. And that takes precedent over like everything. Uh, question, is there a way to see in the console a way to like see which style sheet is the one that's uh, just, so like for example, you're on a page and you're changing the color to red, for example, on a point board, and uh, you have multiple style sheets. Is there a way to see which mm -hmm. one is the one that's handling that style and then change? It's whatever is highlighted here. Whatever is highlighted here is the one that ultimately gets rendered in. Right. So like Let's just go to a, like, a particular website. Um, I, don't know, I don't want you guys looking at my Gmail. Cool. Let's just look at here. If I look at my elements, you could see it's base.css, scss, or layout.scss is pulling in certain ones from the body. When you see it get really nested, you'll start to see them get struck out because this one doesn't have the highest priority. And then you can check a look at computed to see this is everything that got computed for this body element. And this is what had the highest points overall for everything, when everything got combined. Cool? The other difference between IDs and classes is classes will apply to multiple tags, and IDs you can only put on, you should only put on one. It's unique. So I have an ID of your boy, I should only see ID of your boy one time, unlike your whole HTML. Cool? What was your question? Are divs just arbitrary tags that are just used for styling as opposed to like headers, like they're formatted in a certain way? Yeah. No, you're totally right. Divs and spans are typically just used for styling. 
because it doesn't add any real markup to the page, but it allows you to add wrappers for either like some sort of container or from st or for styling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, let's continue. Any other questions? Those are good questions. Yeah, that's the main difference between like div and span. There's an extra line break. Cool. This is a good question. All right, so let's actually like add some functionality since like you've done these labs. The idea here is that um, I have this website and I want to slap images onto this website. So if you hear me say like slap it on the DOM, that means that I want to just like add something to the DOM. Um, the old, <laughs> the last mod three, well two mod threes ago, like somebody said it in blogs. I thought it was really funny. I started saying it. It's not an Evans Wang original. All right, cool. So the idea here is in mod three, specifically for programming from now on, the most important thing is going to be like your process. How you're approaching how to solve a problem is going to be like the biggest thing that's going to take you and transcend Flatiron School and just help you as a developer. So if I wanted to like add something to this page, what would I need to do? Just even in plain English. You don't have to talk about it in code at all. Sure, right, I need some sort of image tag, right? Because I can't add text to my HTML. Like if I wanted to add an image here, right, the first thing I would want is like an image tag. Like I couldn't just put like picture and then like set some like, uh, I don't know, cool guy smooth dot JPEG. That's not gonna work, right? I need an image tag. I need to add HTML to my HTML so the HTML will render. Huh? So I need some sort of image tag, right? So I can't actually just write it in the HTML, I can. But the idea is we want to use JavaScript to add it to the page. So how can I do that? How can I make an image tag with JavaScript? Right? There's this like API, so you can do document, dot create element. You seen this yet? What does this do? And how do I actually finish this? It creates a new node, right? But what node does it make? Right, like whatever you want, right? I can just, yeah, I can make a, I can make a brand new p tag. I can make a brand new h1 tag. I can make a brand new image tag, right? Just like this. So, I need a reference to this, so I should save it into a variable, so I actually have access to it later, right? So I just make a little const. Should I use letter const? Smart, right? I'm never going to make this image tag into an li tag, right? And so because I'm making this like immutable object, so to speak, I'm just going to use const. So I'm going to put const image equals to this document create element image. So what should be image, the variable? Yeah, the image tag. Y'all, y'all did the labs, right? I thought this lecture was going to go a lot smoother. Help me out here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If I put image, what should I get back? Yeah. All right. And just a regular old image tag. So now I have the HTML. How do I make sure that this image tag actually can point to something? Source. Right. I need the source, right? So these are all attributes of the image tag. So if we take a look, right, all these things are just attributes. This div has an ID attribute. This div has a class attribute. If I had a regular image tag, it would have a source attribute. These are all just properties of the tag. So if we take a look at it, I can just, how do I add key values? How do I add properties to an object? If I were to do something like image.charlie, all right, is equal to brown. What would I get if I looked at image again? Oops, it's a typo. Oh, what's happening here?
Hmm? Look at all of these properties here. All right? If it's not a recognized DOM API, it'll actually be hidden. So we could see that Charlie actually, in fact, exists. So I can call this property of Charlie on this image if I wanted to, because they're just objects. So that's why we have this document object model. So you can interact with each one of the things on the DOM as regular objects in JavaScript. So if I just took a look at all the properties, these are all the properties. So right now, this image tag has no source. right? So if I scroll all the way down, you can see source is actually like blank. So we can set that image property to something. So how can we do that? Image.src, and what do you want to make that image? Yeah, I think I have a stupid one here. Oh, yeah, I like this one. This one's money. Oh, yeah, cool. Boom. All right, so now if I take a look at image, what should I see? So now this image has a source, right? A recognized DOM API for this particular node, so that's why it comes up. If I wanted to add an ID to it, how would I do that? Image that ID, right? And now it's like, cool pick, bruv. So if I take a look at image, I see it has both a source and an ID attribute. Cool. All right, so the idea here is that like you need to add HTML to HTML, so we had to create an image tag. It's probably not. It's definitely not. Right, okay. The, the question is, why are we like doing all of this in the console here as opposed to actually writing the code in the code editor, specifically writing directly to the HTML? So the problem I posed to you was like, I can very easily go into the HTML and just do image source and then just like cool smiley dot like, I don't know, PNG. I think that's a file type, right? Why didn't I just do this? The idea here is that you want to be able to have your website render conditionally. And so you can have a very fluid, solid user experience. So for example, let's take a look at a very popular website, um, Airbim. Yeah. Cool. So let's take a look at what's happening here. Do you think that Airbnb has created a separate HTML for every single location in the world that I'm searching for? Let's say you want to go to uh, Peru. Right? So I'm going to go to Peru soon, and I'm actually going to fly out tomorrow because you guys are <laughs> driving me nuts. And I'm, I'm going, and I'm taking just me and my five kids. Yeah? And I'm going to go. And look at this, how it's loading. Right? It's pulling these images dynamically, meaning if I were to change the, my search engine location, I'm simply going to change the source of each of these images every single time. The layout will be exactly the same. So there's some HTML already on this page, and you should have seen it as it first loaded. There was a container right here that held everything. And there's an image tag there, and there's probably like a p tag, an h1 tag, another couple p tags, and then like another p tag here. Because this is in the same line as this, I would make this a span, so it's in line. But each of those would be divs. Right? So if I change the place where I'm going, all I need to do essentially is grab these DOM elements and then change the source of them. And so that way my website can render dynamically. And so that's why I want to use JavaScript rather than hard coding my HTML, the exact source. For just like literally a better user experience. So where does the, oh, where does the DOM like, stuff that we're writing Okay, so where does all the stuff that I'm writing inside the console sort of go? All of this right here, right? Once I refresh, it's gone. The idea here is that I'm just trying to show you the process, the thought process behind how we're going to do something, right? We'll transpile, we'll write it all inside the editor with the notes about like the step-by-step, -step, like how should I be approaching something? 
and any of these new feature sets. And then later on, probably not tomorrow, tomorrow you get like a review, but Thursday, Friday, we'll talk about persisting things because you're gonna pull from a database. Right now, nothing's being persisted. The idea is that I need you to get the feature to work and then we'll connect it to like the database. So right now, I'm just gonna give you an image, like a URL for it, so that like, hey, how do I add an image to the DOM? How do I add an image to the page? Great, I'm gonna slap it on the DOM, no big deal. But now, what if that URL came from a database? And then now I have to go get the data from the database and then slap it to the DOM. And so this is just like the step-by-step. The step. Yeah. That was like a great question, by the way. Kind of. So the idea is here, like right now, this HTML, right, was like the framework for the website that I had. Now I'm going to use JavaScript, and then I'm going to like add stuff to the page based on whatever the user wants to do. So like we're going to get to like user input here in a second, um, but like that should make more sense here in a little bit. I promise I'm going to get to that. That's a good question. All right. So the idea here is now I have this HTML that I'm adding to my HTML. So where do I want to add this image tag? If I'm looking at my HTML, what would make the most, the most sense to add to? Where do you think it would be good to do that? This, this container, right? Literally add images here, bet. And the idea is that this is what I want my JavaScript to do. Add this image tag to this container. So what do I need in order to add something to this container? What do I need access to if I'm going to write to the container? I probably need the container, right? Like if I'm going to put something in a cookie jar, I need the cookie jar to put the cookie in. You know what I mean? Like I can't, if it's like on the top shelf, I can't like just dump it in there. I'm not going to like, like Jordan and like throw it in. So the idea is I need access to this container. So how do I actually get access to this container? Right, there's a couple ways to actually do that. And so in this readme I've shown you, and I'm going to like walk you through it. So the first thing is, if you're old like me, and you have like the history, then document.getElementById is how you grab DOM nodes just by the ID. So if you're getting a particular element by ID, how many, I'm, I'm going to upload the code. How, ma how many elements should I be getting back if I'm grabbing an element by its ID? One, right? And we also talk about the fact that IDs are unique and should only appear one time on your page. Versus classes can appear multiple times. So if I get elements by class name, how many should I get? Right, possibly multiple, right? A collection. So let's actually put that into practice, right? Let's say I had, um, this div has a class of semantic and this div also has a class of semantic. So if I were to do something like element get elements by class name. So what is the element I'm actually looking at? I'm probably going to ask for like the whole thing, right? Probably like the document. Yeah. Document get elements by class name. And I want to look for a class of semantic. And naturally it gives me back those two divs in the collection. So now I have access to those two divs, this one and this one. And let's take a look at this right here. What does that look like to you? It looks like an array. It is an array-like object, but it is not an array. It comes back as an HTML collection. So because it's not an array, can I guarantee that I can use certain methods on it, like for each or map? No. no. But because it's an array-like object, and you can see the fact that they're indexed, I can probably do something like this. What would this return me? Google. Right. They're indexed. Right. So. Cool. So let's say I want to grab a particular item by its ID. Which item do I want to grab off of this HTML? Like this container one. That's what I'm going to add everything to. Yeah? 
Yes. Um, the question is, can I make this uh, HTML collection into an array so that I can get all my array methods on it? And you can, literally like array.from, and then you can pass in this collection. It's, it, it looks so for an array-like object. Wow. And then you can use all like the iterators on it and all the array methods. Cool? What, what good questions. Don't be scared. I don't know. People think I'm scary because I'm like a, I guess a somewhat large Asian man. Um, I don't know. I'm super goofy. All right, cool. So check it out. I can do get elements by ID. Get element by ID. And what ID do I want? Container. Cool. So what should I get back? Do I have a reference to this thing? No, so I should probably just make a var. You're just guessing? or <laughs> I'm never going to change this div into anything else, so I should be using const here, right? Const image container equals to this reference. So now I have this image container, and I have the image. Now I want to add this image to the image container. How would I do that? Huh? Dot inner HTML. Oh. Right? Add image tag to div. No jQuery. Okay, okay. Let's find out. I'm just looking around and I'm like, bloop, bloop, bloop. What's this? Check mark? Oh, I'm so money. What's that? Oh my god, a pen child. But what is a pen child? Let's find out. A pen child MDN because the MDN is like your best friend, yeah? So what does this do? It's a method that adds a node to the end of a list of children of a specified node. Great. This sounds like exactly what I want to do. So just ripping that straight and then learning how it works, which is important. I can, whoop, so daisy. I can then take the image container and I can run append child on it. So append child. And what do I want to append? The image I just made, right? So I can look at this. And what do you think will happen? Oops. Look at that. Oh my god. This champion right here. So the, <laughs> that's me and my brother, if you have to know. We rocked. Did you ever watch the Rugrats? Yeah. Yeah. I rock, paper, scissor, and I won. So I got to be Lil. Lil's cooler. Just saying. So, well, if you don't watch that show, Lil's always like the best. She was like, yeah, let's do that. And feels like, I don't know about that one. So, but either way, the idea here is now I can take a look at my elements. I can open this container and look, the image source that I just created was added as the last element in that node, as the last child, right? So it's not above this p tag, it's the last one. Cool? Yeah, the, the idea here is like, if I refresh, what happens? Boop. It's gone. Everything is gone. It's not persisted. Kind of like a one-star user experience, right? Wackadactyl. So in the index.js, what we want to do, right, is we want to talk about that process. So the first thing is, right, I want to add an image to the HTML using powerful JavaScript. So the first thing is, right, I need to add HTML to HTML. So what I want to do is create an image, an image tag. I need to create an image tag so that it be, it's actually HTML. So how do we do that? I asked my good friend the document. I was like, yo, document. What's up, dog? Let's create an element together. Yay. And what element did we make? The IMG, right? The image tag. Great. So now we need to add the source or actual link to the image, All right? Because we took a look at what that image tag was. And so do I have a reference to this? All right, so I should var const like image, right? Image tag, whatever you want to do. And so remember, these are just objects with a bunch of key value pairs, a bunch of properties. So what property did I want to change on this? Image tag, right? It's the SRC. And then I made it into whatever I wanted. Bloop. Cool. And then what did I do? 
Like, where do I add this image? Question mark. Look at this. Oh, no. Look at that. Ow! Wow, why did that get so canted? That was weird. Oh, it's like, it's italics. All right, so where do I add this image? How do we figure that out? We looked at the base HTML and was like, where's the best place to put this? If it doesn't exist, what do I do? If it didn't exist, what would I do? If this wasn't here, what can I do? You just make it. You're the full stack developer. If it's not there, guess what you could do? You can make it. If this div was not here, and it's like, great, you should add images to that div. What can you do? Yeah, you're like, oh no, I need to add this image to this div, but I can't grab that div. It's not unique enough. Say less, fam. Unique. And now I have it. And so what can I do now in my JavaScript? I, I have an ID on an element, and I think I want to like get that element by its ID. Oh my lord. <laughs> All right, and then what's the ID again? Unique. Do I have a reference to this? There we go. Oh, you want to chain on methods like a dirty plug? No. Uh, you can uh, chain methods to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but this is um, sort of the right way to do it, only because it's more readable. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to, oh my lord, I can just append child right to this thing. You know, let's do, let's let's slap that right on the DOM. <laughs> we can do that, but that's basically the idea. Right. Let's create a reference to it, and then let us add the. Oops. What the? And then we want to like slap it on the DOM. So like, where do I want to add this image? Right there. And then finally, slap that on the DOM. Cool. Does that like bother anybody? I always thought it was hilarious, but if it's like offensive, just let me know after class, and then I'll start saying append child, which is somehow better. You know. To slap it on the DOM there. Cool? So if this is all in my JavaScript and I simply were to refresh, it's going to be there. Cool? So like, let's put this into more practical use, right? To your point. And the idea here is that um, I want to get some data from the internet. And so I have all these dank memes, right? And like, how do I add them to the page? Well, we already kind of figured this out. I have a dank meme.js file. So in the same way that Ruby did, in terms of that require relative file, how can I get this dank memes, how can I get access to it here? Well, let's take a look. Ready? How does JavaScript run? How does your JavaScript know what file it's in? Yeah, that's right. It's exactly right. It's somewhere in your HTML. So I want to make sure that I have these dank memes before I have my index.js because it's important because HTML is top to bottom, left to right. If it was like this and I reference the dank memes, then it wouldn't exist. Right? So if I have that, that would mean that this const of dank memes is loaded before my index.js. So index.js, in theory, I should be able to just console log dank memes, even though it's not referenced anywhere in this file. So let's take a look. Cool. So who feels like pretty good about like pulling in JavaScript from other files? It's pretty easy. It's easy. Okay. I could just keep on through the question, There is not a specific spot you should be calling all the script tags. However, Generally speaking, industry practice, it puts it all in the head tag. You can, however, put it at the bottom of your body, and we're going to go into that literally right after I finish the DOM lecture, so into like events. Cool? Yeah? If you console log the um, dank memes, how come they're not printed on the page? Like, if you... What do you mean printed on the page? Or like they're not showing. Exactly. So remember how I was able to slap that on the DOM? Right? I had to create an element, I had to change the source, and then I had to append the child. Here, all I do is 
console log. I haven't done any of that with them. But the idea is now I want all these dank memes on my page. So how can I do that? Yeah, I have to go through every single one of these things, right? So I can do dank memes, which is an array. And then how many of you got through those iterators? Feeling good about the for each, the map, the reduce? OK, cool. So I do for each. And then for each takes what? For each, right? Um, remember, JavaScript is very weird in the way that um, this for each is simply a method on an array. In the same way that if I were to do this in Ruby, I do each do end, and I give it right a block of code right here in line. So this do end is sort of like its own method for this each. And so in JavaScript, for each needs its own sort of method. But right now in JavaScript, we don't really call them methods. We call them functions. And I'm going to get into the differences between them um, in the this lecture next week. But right now, this needs some sort of like method, right? some sort of functionality. So I can either pass it a callback function, or I could be a G, and I can write it in line right here. So I have a function right here in line. And what do I want to do with each of these elements? Remember, this function receives each of these elements one by one. And what are each of these elements one by one here? That's like a meme URL, right, or whatever it is. I'm just going to put meme. So what do I want to do for each of these? Hmm? I need to create an image element. And then I need to change the image source to that particular one. So I'm going to do document dot create element, Oop, and I'm just going to make an image. I need a reference to it, so const right meme image, and then on that meme image, I'm going to change the source to the individual meme that I'm getting, every single one. Remember, it's just a URL. And then I'm going to just slap it on the DOM. So I already have the image container. So I'm just going to do image container, a pen child. And I'm going to slap that brand new meme image on the DOM. Cool. So let's take a look. Oh, no, unexpected token. Oh, it's because I left the Ruby code in there. <laughs> Embarrassing. And there it is. Look at all these dank memes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Yes. You ever seen this yet? They use coding and algorithms so that don'ts don't crash into each other. If going to crash, run a function don't. Yes. Oh man. JavaScript's weird. So like zero, string zero. Zero is also e like slightly equal to array. So if you it's true. And then No. Nah. Yeah, it'll totally it'll totally bust. So does the string 0 equal array false? So funny. All right. So <laughs> this is all of us over here just building this shallow house. Anyways, the idea here is let's just say dank memes didn't come from a local file, but I made a request to a database that gave me an array of images. Now I can use that array of images and kind of like add them to the page, very much like how Airbnb will do it. If I put in Peru, it'll go to the database, get all these images of Peru and like places to stay, and then for each them, and then add them to the screen. And so that's why we want to use JavaScript to kind of render a page dynamically. Does that like help out like that thought process? Um, no. So the idea here is that this for each will run this function for each of them. So the idea here is kind of like if I did something like a function, if I did a function, right, and it was called like add to DOM, and all it did was it took in a URL, and then it just did this. So I can do add to DOM, and I need to pass in a URL. So I can do dank memes, zero. Dank memes one, dank memes two. It runs that function every single time, so the cons don't clash because they're their own function every single time. 
Is that kind of the question you're getting at? Yeah. Each one will run this function for each of the items in the array. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So if we take a look, right, now you'll see this image source and this image source. I'm making image source for each one of these memes, and I'm just slapping it to the DOM. Are there any questions? Yeah. So remember, I'm going through an array, and for each of them, I'm going to run this function, this callback function. Of course. So the idea here is what I can do is instead of this function, so I'm going to like keep the spacing here so that you can kind of see it separately. So this is an anonymous function. There's no name to this because I created it in line when it needed it. If I wanted to, I have a function that does the exact same thing. I can just kill this and then run add to DOM right here in the for each. So it's going to run add to the DOM for each of the elements in the dank memes array. So it's basically doing this up until like the last item in the array. Is that helpful? Cool. Callbacks take a little bit. But remember, this for each is going to invoke add to the DOM. So add to the DOM is not being invoked here. It's just a reference to the function. When you did it in line, uh, did the anonymous function, you wouldn't be able to call that elsewhere. No, I cannot call this anywhere else because it has no name. I have no reference to it. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, Um, I, I would rather a separate one individually because of the way const works and the way the lookup works, this function will look outside for that same variable and const cannot be redeclared. So if I put const image tag here, it'll attempt to, I mean it'll work. Because if I use let, what I'm going to do is reassign it. And this image is going to be completely different from all of these images. It's, the, it's for readability, not that it wouldn't work. Yeah? All right, cool. Why don't we do this? I can tell that some of you are very entertained by this lecture. Um, so why don't you take like a five minute break and then we'll go into events. Cool? So Oh, we're just taking a break. We're taking a break. We're taking a break. Say again, over. So the, the first image is totally separate from the loop, right? Like if you were to inspect it or something. The I'm sorry. Browser. Give me one second. <laughs> like I'll start the recording. Hey, it's your boy. What's going on? Just a quick tutorial on events. Go ahead and hit that like button. Smash the notification bell. Wow, 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 wow. To make all my own sound effects. All right, hey. So I want to go over events super fast. Um, but if you guys want, I can always do another optional thing to take a deeper dive into events. Um, because as I've floated around, uh, Charlie, Matt, and I have all agreed that this class is like pretty strong. So if you guys want deeper dives in anything, just feel free. Remember, this is your learning experience. Go ahead and just ask. Cool. I understand the class is just a little quiet, so I'm going to make jokes for me. And it's going to be a good time. OK. So let's get into it. The idea here is that we already know how to grab elements off the DOM, and we understand that the elements that we grab off the DOM are just objects. They have a bunch of properties that we can just access like key value pairs. And that's how we can manipulate the DOM with JavaScript. Oh, super fun. So what are events? Um, I'm just going like, to kind of talk at you for a while because I can tell this class you know, just wants me to give you information, and that's OK. Uh, events are always happening. It's anything that happens in the browser. 
So Big Brother is very real. The idea is that I can have my mouse moving here. And notice how there's absolutely no console logs, right? Nothing is happening. I can't see anything, but it doesn't mean that every movement that you do on the web is not being uh, noticed. It's not being recorded, but it's not being noticed, right? It is, in fact, being noticed. So if I'm like scrolling around here or I hit this submit button, right, or I click this alert button or this console log, nothing is actually happening on the page, but all of those events are happening. Anytime I scroll a little bit, I'm at the bottom, the browser knows that I've scrolled to the bottom. Whether it tells you that it knows about it or not is a different story. So the idea here is we want to intercept any one of these events and then have something happen. So for example, I'm clicking this alert me button, right? What I want to happen is an alert to pop up. But right now, no thing is happening, right? Oh, nothing. So what I need to do is listen for the event that is this button click. Once this button is clicked, then I can do something. And so in terms of the callback, at first, uh, I need to listen for the event, and if that button is clicked, then I need to fire off a function. That's what the callback is for. So the first thing is, did, was that button clicked? If the button was clicked, fire off a function. That function is just gonna do alert me. So that alert me function is the callback to the event. So far, so good. All right, cool. So let's do that. If I hit alert me, uh, oh no, all right. What do I need to do in order to listen for this alert me button being clicked? What do I actually need? Yes, I need to add an event listener, right? Literally add event listener, right? But what do I need? Remember the cookie jar, it's on the top shelf. I need the actual like button itself, right? If I'm gonna listen for a button, I need that button, right? That's like pretty simple logic. So how do I grab this button? I can go into my HTML, or I can click this button right here. Wow, that zoom was pretty intense, right? If I click that button, I'm then in this toggle mode where I can highlight stuff, and it'll tell me what I've highlighted. I can simply click the button while I'm in that toggle mode, and it'll tell me exactly what in the HTML that button is. And so right now, there's these data attributes called data-name. Oh no, I can't grab this button. There's a way to grab something off its data attribute, but right now I don't want to get into that um, because it's, uh, it's annoying. So how can I grab this button if there's no unique values to this? Add it to the DOM. Yeah, that's right. You could just add it to the HTML. So I'm going to look and I'm going to troll through and I'm going to find the alert button in my HTML. And so in order to create a unique identifier for it, I can simply do ID equals to alert. Wow. So if I refresh the page, I now see that there is an ID of alert here. So how can I grab this particular ID? I can ask the document, hey, give me that element by its ID. What I want to very quickly introduce you to is the new way of grabbing things off the DOM. And that is you can talk to the document and you can do something called query selector. Query selector works just like its CSS selector counterpart. And that is if there's an ID, you need that hash. And if it's a class, you need the dot, right? So if this particular one is an ID, so I need to let it know I need an ID of alert. Boom. And you can even see, oh god, Chrome is so powerful. But I need a reference to this, right? So I'm going to put var. Ooh, right, const alert button is equal to this query selector with the ID of alert. What is the difference though? Because like, you get yes. Um, so remember how I said get element by ID returns a particular one? If you do get elements by class name, it returns an HTML collection. Uh, if you do query selector and you do ID, it just gives you back the element. If you do query selector and there was like a bunch of classes, and I did like class, and then I did like alert, and there was like a bunch of alert classes in my HTML, then it would return to me a different array-like object that I can use for each, and I can use map. So query selector is sort of like the new way, um, and is compatible with, I think, all modern browsers in most somewhat dated versions as well. So everything is all about compatibility. So query selector, you're totally fine. 
I believe so. I, I, I could be wrong, but I think so. I learned Get Element by ID because it, it works with like Internet Explorer. Right. right? So, great. So I have this alert button, right? And like some of you mentioned, I need to listen for when that alert button is clicked. So I can take the alert button and I can literally be like, yo, I need to listen for that event. So I need to add an event listener. And the event listener takes two arguments, right? Which makes so much sense. The first one is, what is the event? Do I want to listen for a scroll? Do I want to listen for a click? Do I want to listen for a double click? Do I want to, want to listen when the H key is pressed? What do I want to listen for? Click, right? Super easy, and that should be a string, sorry. Great, and now, right, when that alert button is clicked, it should do something. So how can we tell it what to do? Write a function. Yes, write a function, right? You guys like this? Just like me talking to my, I'm just gonna do that, because I think your class is cool with it. Write a function. Yes, thank you, mysterious stranger. High on helium. So I can either pass it a callback that I've defined outside, or I can write it in line, right? So I write a function, boop boop. Man, this coffee is really getting to me. So just like how the for each receives an argument, right? what do you think that this function should be aware of? It should probably be aware of what? Well, remember, I only care if this button was clicked. So this callback function should probably care about what? the click, whether or not it happened, all right? So that is known as the event. So this callback function always receives the event, which should make sense, all right? Uh, I'm gonna be a dirtbag and I'm just gonna put E, and you will see this E syntax in like all the stack overflows and all like the quoras and all that. So if you see E, it just stands for event. So what I could do is, just for simplicity's sake, let me simply log what E is so you understand what's actually happening. So I've added it now to the page. So if I simply click log, what will happen? Nothing, right? But if I click alert, I should see the event. And it was a mouse event. And you could see exactly the x, y coordinates on the screen as well as on the browser, right? Sometimes it's different. Where that click happened, which is crazy because this is the screen and that's the browser. Right now I'm using half the space because I have the dev tools open. So, interesting, I could take a look at all the properties of this mouse event. Oh my lord, that's a lot. But what I really want to do now is let's actually take all of this and put it inside our JavaScript. So inside my JavaScript, uh, I gotta talk about this here too. Undefined, Boop. cool. So the next thing we want to talk about is in the event, I want to know what was actually clicked. So I can look at one of the properties, and you'll see one of the properties for this mouse event is going to be, oh wow, oh there it is, target. So what was actually clicked? So I can always check to see what is the event.target. So if I refresh, the target is the button itself. Cool? Any questions on that? That made sense, right? Like what I'm clicking on, the target of that click should be this button. So now I have this button, right? And remember, I have this callback function. So what do I want this thing to really do? What should this alert button do? Alert. It's just going to alert and say, wahaha, lols, you clicked me. Smiley face. So if I refresh, nothing happens here, which makes sense. And when I click the alert button, that callback function gets fired only when that particular button gets clicked. So naturally, we can very easily sort of conclude that if I wanted each individual one, right, what I would need to do is grab the button, add an event listener to it, and then do something once that event is fired. That's really kind of the steps, right? The idea here is I can easily have you walk me through what the next step is, right? If I wanted this console log, right, or this console error, how would I do that? Just walk me through the steps. What's the first thing I need 
in order to add an event listener to this console error button. I need the console error button, right? But can I access it right now? No, so what can I do? I can add an ID or a class to it, and then I can query selector it. Once I've query selected it, I can add an event listener to it, but what event do I want to listen for? The click, and then what do I do with that click? Probably console error, right? Cool? I mean, that's just like the thought process behind it. It's not about memorization. It's about the process. And that is like, what do I need? And then what am I trying to do? The code will sort of come along. You need to have that pseudo code in your mind. Like, I need this button so I can listen for a click. I need to write the code that's like adding event listener click. And then it needs to fire some sort of callback function. That's really about it. So there's something that is a very interesting topic that I want to get to. And that is going to be, whoa. And that is going to be something, yes. That's going to be something called event delegation. So what is event delegation? The idea here is that there are three phases to every single event that ever happens. And that is it starts at the window. And then whatever you do the event on, is the target phase. And then it bubbles back up to the window. It always bubbles back up to the window. So the idea here is if this doesn't make any sense, the only takeaway you need from this is if I click this table row, does the table body know about it? Just follow the lines here. Does if I click this, does the table body know about it? Yes, the parent element will always know about its children. It's like this omnipotent, crazy mom that always knows what you're doing, right? So if I click this table row, does the table data, this TV, know about it? No, right? If I click the table row, it goes into capture phase. It's the table row. This is the target, and then it bubbles back up. So anything below doesn't know. If I click the parent, everything above knows. If I click this TD, does the table row know? Yes. Yes, because it's the parent. If I click this TD, does this table row know? No. No, it doesn't. Right? So it's only in that chain. Only in the parent chain. How can we use this to our advantage? Well, I take a look at this and I see three buttons that I all want listening for a particular click. So let me show you an example, right? Um, event delegation. Do, do, do. Sometimes there is like a really good, this is the one I want. Dang it, where is it? Is it event? No. It's a run. No, that's not it. What is event bubbling? No, no, no. There's like a stack overflow. Oh, it's so good. I'll find it for you later. What is DOM event? This is the one I just clicked on? Yeah, it's just on. Dang it. No. All right, I'll find it later. The idea here is that if I click this particular button, does this parent div know about it? Yes. What if I click this button, does the parent div know about it? What if I was smart and I added the event listener to this div and I clicked on any of these buttons, would this parent div know about it? So let's actually put that into practice. So I have parent, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to document dot get uh, sorry I'm old school query selector and I want to query select what the ID of parent so when you're doing this for the first few times always console log everything to make sure that you're getting what you think you're getting and so I would console log this and this is going to be const right button parent cool so on the button parent I want to add an event listener. 
And then what event do I want to listen for? The click. So I'm going to get rid of this. Boop. And what function do I want to run? Well, it receives the event for sure. So all I want to do is let's console log e.target just for funsies and see what happens. So if I refresh, what if I click the submit button? What happens? Remember, it's not a part of this parent. But what if I click this high? If I click this high right here, I'm clicking, right? Nothing. But if I click this console error, what should I get? Notice how it's the target is going to be the console error button. If I click the alert me, what should the target be? What if I click this console log button? The target will be whatever I actually clicked on, which makes total sense, right? So let's scale this out a little bit. Uh, the question I have is that uh, obviously if you click anywhere within the div that isn't a button, will it fire anything? Remember, this div, right, if I highlight over div, it's this entire div. So it's listening for every single thing in there. Meaning, if I click where the blue is, even though it's not a button, will it fire? Yeah. So if I click it, it's the div. So, exactly. So how can I use this to my advantage? Well, let me do this real quick, right? ID log, and then I will do ID error. Cool? So inside here, I know the e.target is going to be the particular button. And I only want certain things to happen if, if a particular button is clicked. So if I click a button, the e.target, and it has an ID of alert, then I should fire the alert function. If the console log button is clicked, and it has an ID of log, then I should console log. So how can I translate that into code? Well, we'll start with this. If, right, the e.target, which we know will be the button. Which button, though? Well, if e.target has an ID of, say, alert, then you can Run alert. Ha! It's me. Ya boah alert. So let's find out. If I refresh, I'm still getting those logs. If I click console error, does that e.target have an ID of alert? Does this have an ID of alert? So I can add one event listener and simply add more conditionals. But what if I'm, I'm super lazy? You can do a case, yeah. What if, right? Oh, wow. The e.target was not alert, but instead was log or error. Log. Then I want to console log. Eats for cheats. Right? But what if, here we go now, bear with me. This was. Error. I can console error. Get done goofed. So let's find out. I click the div. Remember, the parent always knows about it. So console error will give me a console error. You done goofed. The log will log, and the alert me will alert. So event delegation can be useful because it saves memory. I don't have to make an event listener for every single thing. I just need to slap it on the parent and then it'll listen for everything. What you don't want to do is add it to the document because everything you click in the document will fire that event and you don't want that. So the rule of thumb is you want to add it, and I see a question, you want to add it to the lowest element that has everything that you need. So for example, if one of these was, say, here, then I would add it to probably this div. 
the lowest element that's capturing everything that you need. So you're not adding three event listeners, you're adding one. Who feels like event delegations is okay or helpful or pretty good? Ja? Are you there, Ja? It's me, Ross Trent. It's got a Lonely Island song. All right, so, yeah, they're funny. So, great. So we got through event delegation. Now the last thing is kind of like, the feature that I want to add is I put a comment in here and I'm like, yes, five stars. And I hit submit. I want that comment to appear right here in like a comments container or something. If the comment container wasn't there, what can and should I do? I'm just going to slap a brand new div in my HTML that says comments container. So now I have something to add it to. All right. Um, luckily for all of us, I think I did that already. Oh, wow. Plus, plus. Cool. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I can listen and understand when this form, I hit this submit button, I can then do something. Right? I can then do something. So what do I need? Well, I need the form, right? So does this form have any unique identifying information that can help me grab the form? So how would I grab the form? Right, so let me do that. Ready? Const, right, form. Let's do document dot query selector. And what was the idea again? I think it was like comment form. Comment form. So ID of comment form. Cool. So now that form, what am I listening for? Form dot form dot form dot submit. I'm listening for an event, all right? So what am I listening for? Is it the click or is it the submit? Okay, do you click forms or do you submit forms? Submit forms, right? HTML5 is very generous. If you put click, it'll fire either way. It actually fires both events. It'll fire the click and the submit event, but the proper thing is the submit. So you submit forms, right? Otherwise, if you click forms, in theory, if I click the form, like right here, it'll, it'll run. What I really want to make sure is I'm listening for the submit action of the form. Otherwise, it'll always fire even if I click somewhere in the form, and I don't necessarily want that. So I'm listening for a submit event, and if you're looking for events, you can MDN events, and you can see hundreds of events. And so then your Mod3 project becomes really fun because you're like, what events do I want to do? Right? A, a scroll, a zoom, a double click, anything, and you can have your app do all this crazy stuff. So what do I want to actually happen? What is this argument again? It's a, it's a function, but specifically because it's being used as an argument, it's a callback function. Are you feeling a little bit better about this callback function? So function, boop boop. And remember, it receives the what? The event. It has to know about the event. So let's just do console log the event.target. So in theory, I type in something here, and then I hit submit, and I should see the event.target. Hmm, that's so bizarre. It looks like the page is like refreshing for some reason. The idea here is let's take a look at the form. I see form with the ID. What I don't see is the classic things that we're used to. And that is method post. And then action is like slash animals one. Right? Whatever this is supposed to go to. Correct? Yes, Rails, HTML. All right. What happens if I do this? Well, let me let me check. If I hit submit, what the there we go. It's trying to go to slash animals one. Specifically post to it. Because that's what the forms do, right? I don't want it to do that because if it does that, it triggers the request response cycle that refreshes my whole page. If you look at it very closely, oops, right, look closely at the screen. That's why I have to change the color. You'll see it sort of like do that refresh. And when it does that refresh, look at the DOM on the right. It loads everything again. What a terrible user experience. I don't want to have to download all that HTML again. I just want this one thing to happen. 
If I'm using this website on my phone, think of all the data I have to do, all right? This is back in the day when like it wasn't unlimited data. I'm on like this two gig plan, like, it's terrible. So I want to minimize the amount of data I have to send back and forth. So what I can do is I need to somehow prevent the form from submitting, all right? So the default action of a form is a submit. So I could take the event and I can literally prevent the default, which is a function that I need to invoke. If I do that, you could see that it actually stops that post action from happening. And so I'm preventing the default. What I don't want you confused by is prevent, God bless you, is prevent default stops refreshing. That's not the case. It's just that the form by default will submit a request and because there's no action or route, it doesn't know where to go and it will just reload that same page. However, does a div have a default action? No. No, so if you are grabbing a div and I see you put e.preventDefault, I can assume that you're just guessing. However, if there's an a tag, an anchor tag, what is the default action for an anchor tag? It, it does like a link to a different website. So if I put e.preventDefault on an anchor tag, will it go to the link? No. And so prevent default prevents the default of that particular node, that particular element. Cool? All right, so I know we're cutting into lunch, but just give me five minutes, all right? You'll be out of here in five minutes, and then you'll just take a longer lunch. Cool? Or do you guys want to break for lunch and then come back and do another lecture? Yeah, but I mean, we're... We can skip classes. No, it's fine. All right, so check it out. So we prevented default, right? And now what we want to do, now what we want to do is we want to be able to get this user input, right? Coo, 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 coo. All right? How can I grab this user input? Well, I can always click this, scroll on over to see input, and be like, oh my god, does it have a unique identifier? Yes or no? If no, add one. And then I can see that there's this new comment ID. So right here, I can do document.querySelector with an ID of new comment. I need a const comment. So now I have access to this comment, yeah? What is this comment? What is it? Input. It's an input, right? So remember, input has ID, type, placeholder, but how do I actually get what was typed? What is that property on an input? It's the value. So what I really want is this comment is the input dot value. So if we want, we can always check, right? Console log the comment. And what we can do is refresh, and we can see, hmm, eat. If I hit submit, I could see that this input, right, is right here. Now let me console log the comment dot value. What is the value? Bloop. It's actually pulling the value from the form. Here's a very common gotcha. If I do this, and I'm grabbing the comment input field, and then I look at this prevent default, and I go into this form, what will what is comment.value every single time here? It should be empty string. Remember, I'm on line 16. I'm grabbing the dot value right here. When does this line load? That line loads right now. And on the refresh, what is it right now? It's empty, and I don't want it to be empty. I want to make sure I grab it only after the user hits submit, which makes sense because the user is going to go bloop, 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 and then hit submit. Therefore, the input will actually have text in it. So if your text is always empty, you have to be aware of where you're writing the code in the context execution. So we have the submit, right? And now I have the value. And so now I have the value, what do I want to do? 
I want to slap it on the DOM, right? So where do I want to put it on? All right. Does it matter where I grab the comments container? Do I have to grab it inside the submit or outside, or does it matter? It doesn't really matter when I grab it here. So I'm just going to put const, right, comment container equals to document dot query selector. And that would be comments container. Wow, very good. What a great name. Cool. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oof, embarrassing. So all I'm going to do is take the comment container. Oops. And then I'm just going to pen child the comment. So, woo. Oh, whoop. Comment is not defined. Embarrassing. Hmm? Oh, right, this one. Thank you. Yep. Failed to execute a pen child on a node. What the? What is common container? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I cannot append comment because comment itself is not a node. It's a string. So I need to. Embarrassing. So remember, like I can't add string to the HTML. I have to add HTML to HTML. So I probably need like a p tag. So const p. And then the p dot inner text is going to be the comment. So I'm making a new p tag. I'm making the text of the p tag, the comment. And then I'm going to slap the p tag to the DOM. Word. It's, it's the value attribute of the input. It's not the inner text of the input. We can test. We could test that. If this is a very specific question, we could test that. After. I'm trying to make everyone for lunch. Yeah. Add yeah, ten minutes. Eh, ten percent is fine. So yeah, I have to create HTML. I made that HTML have that text, and then I slap that bad Johnson to the DOM. Are there any questions about the process and what we did today in terms of adding it to the DOM? Prevent default. Event delegation. What are events? Yeah, anything that happens on the browser. Cool? All right, cool. All right, enjoy your lunch.